How many of you know that old song and would say that that's your heart's cry, that you just long to worship God? Anybody today? Amen, somebody. Is it good to worship together today? So glad to be here. Amen. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the most significant concepts in all of the Old Testament is the concept of teshuva. And teshuva is a word that means return or repent. A story that Jesus told that was a story of teshuva was the story of the prodigal son, where the son returns to his father. He comes back to his father. What is so fascinating and significant about today is that today is a day for the people of the church of teshuva, of returning, of coming back to worship. You know, we've not publicly worshiped together for eight weeks or so now, right? And in my lifetime, um, um, unless you were alive and remember 1918, I don't know if there's ever been another season in the, in the church in America where for such a long time as in our lifetimes, this has been the case. And so as we come back together, as the people of God regather together, we return to God, we return confessionally, recognizing that we, as we've been away, we may not have been as we ought. And so today we're, gonna, we're going to confess together a confession that people would say to Jesus, that they would call out to Jesus when he was walking the streets of Galilee in Judea so long ago. They would call out to him, Son of David, have mercy on me. And so today we're going to say together this phrase in confession, Lord, have mercy. Can you say that with me? Lord, have mercy. I want you to stand with me. I'm going to read... Uh, these confessions and then our response as a community is going to be that God have mercy on us. We're going to say, Lord, have mercy. Oh God, we confess that we have not been together gathering here in the name of Jesus. Lord, have mercy. Brad Taylor, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> the thing is, you guys, we should just give it up right now for our tech for our tech guys. I mean, these people, okay, they only they only get a shout out when something goes wrong, right? I mean, these these guys have been carrying us through this whole entire pandemic. You've never seen any of them. Jason, Linda, we just love you. Thank you so much. You're you're incredible. One more time for them. They're just fantastic. Okay, you got your shout out. No, no more jokes, okay? No more Brad Taylors on me. Come on. Okay. We confess that we have spent our idle time thinking about things that are not true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. We've watched movies, TV shows, news programming, and documentaries that have encouraged our minds to reflect on the kingdoms of this world and not the kingdom of God. Lord, have mercy. Maybe that was just for me, not for you there. Um, we confess that we have not always considered the interests of those we live with as much as our own desires in these days. Lord, have mercy. Our thoughts have not been your thoughts, and our ways have not been your ways. Lord, have mercy. And let's all read this verse together. May the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. Lord, have mercy. Lift your voice with us. See that our praise. Oh, let our praise be your welcome. Let our song be a sign that we are here for. Only you, Jesus, we are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Hearts with your life, we are here for you. We are here for you. For only to you, our hearts are open. Nothing here is sitting. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down to you our hearts are open 
Jesus, we gather in your name today. In the name of Jesus, you promised where two or more gather in your name, there you would be among us. So meet with your people today. Would you receive our worship? We long to worship you. We are your people, and just to be with you is enough for us today. May the words of our mouths and meditations of our heart be pleasing to you, O oh God. have a seat. I was reading the Bible, which, you know, is kind of hard to do, but I came across this verse that says, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and teaching. Yeah, this is in Paul's letter to Timothy, who's a young pastor, and he's telling him about ways that he can keep his church community engaged with scripture. Okay, so preaching the Bible, I get. Teaching from the Bible, I get that too. But what about this reading scripture together thing? Is that something I'm supposed to care about? Why did Paul think it was so important? Oh man, for Paul, this was a really significant practice for the people of God. Think all the way back to Mount Sinai, where the Israelites were just rescued from Egypt. They're no longer slaves, and they need a new identity, a new story to live by. And so Moses, he gathers the people together, and he reads the scriptures aloud. He reminds them of where they came from, who they are, and the new future that they're called to live for. This was the first public reading of scripture in the Bible. Yeah, and it didn't stop there. When the people finally got into the land, they did it again. Joshua pulled the people together, and they all listened to the scriptures read aloud so they could remember where they came from and how they could keep living as a part of this new story. So this is something they did all the time then? Well, actually, no. After Joshua died, we don't have any more stories of the people coming together to hear God's word. Instead, the people forgot their story and a whole generation arose that didn't know their God or what God had done for them. But then, centuries later, a king named Josiah rediscovered the scriptures, and he was so excited that he called Israel to begin this practice once again. It sparked a renewal movement. That is, until the people forgot once more, and they ended up in exile. And so this is why, when Ezra and Nehemiah came back from the exile, they needed to remind the people who they are and how they are to live. So this is a powerful practice. Yeah, in fact, reading scripture together became a core part of Jewish life. It was done every week as they gathered in synagogue. Jesus himself participated in this practice. He even launched his mission during the weekly reading of the scriptures. He read from the scroll of Isaiah, and then he told everyone these words were about him. And that brings us all the way back to the early church where Paul told Timothy to keep this practice going to immerse the whole community in the story of the scriptures. Okay, but here's the thing. Most people back then didn't know how to read, so they had to do it publicly. But I can read the Bible by myself. Yeah, and you should totally do that. But don't underestimate the power of this ancient practice. Reading the Bible by yourself can be hard. It can be easy to get distracted. But something happens when you hear God's word read aloud and when you're with other people. And besides, it's really easy. You don't need anyone to preach or teach. You just need to listen to the scriptures and then talk about what you've heard. This is what God's people have always done when they enter into new and uncertain times. They remember their story and who they are through the public reading of the scriptures. If you've been following along with our services online, you may have been wondering to yourself, why aren't you guys doing more, you know, like music or rock and roll? You know, the production value has been maybe a little lousy in your opinion. Well, 
we are kind of under this assumption that in this uncertain and kind of unsettling season, what we ought to be doing is turning our minds back to Scripture. And so we've been reading entire psalms during worship, right? And we've been reading entire chapters of the New Testament together, stories about Jesus and about how to live. And so this morning, we're going to read again. We're going to read together, finally, which is awesome. And we're, the Scripture's split up into three different parts. There's the leader part, which is me. And then there's the adult part. And that's for all of you adults in the room who are in maybe middle school or high school or older than that. Now, there's a part in this, in this in the Scripture reading that's for children. And now the children, that part, we want, we want it to be uh, read by the, the kids that are in downtown, uptown, and tiny town. If, you're, if you usually worship there, would you wave? Are you, you out there? Are they out there, Miss Pam? Do you see them? Yeah, there they are. Yes. So Miss Pam's going to read that part but with you, right, with the kids. So can we all try this together? In honor and reverence of the word of God, can we stand together one more time? Is that okay? Is this too many calisthenics early in the morning? <laughs> Have you been sitting around in your houses too much? Are you doing okay standing up again? I'll take that as commentary. I don't know what that meant. But. Okay, so here we go. We're going to do this together. This is Psalm 66. So read it when it's your part. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. How awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. All right, adults, the next time we get to the children's section, we may need some help prompting with Miss Pam, all right? Kids, this is all participation here, you know. Speak out. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. Okay, kids, here we go. We will come to your temple, O oh Lord. That was awesome. Come and hear, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. All together. Praise, Praise be to God, God who, has who has not rejected, rejected our, our prayer or withheld his, his love from, from us. us. Amen. You can have a seat. So we are going to continue looking into God's word this morning. And we're going to look at, us at a story this morning from the book of Mark. So if you have your Bibles handy, turn to the book of Mark, chapter 4. And we're going to read a story or tell a story. And then we're going to talk about it a little bit. It is so good to be with you here this morning and see your faces. So turn to the book of Mark chapter 4. And this is a story about Jesus with his disciples, and it's evening time. I'm just going to start with verse 35 and just read two verses right now. It says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Okay, so there are all ages in this room today, from the littlest of us to the oldest of us. So we're going to make this a story. We want to tell it so the kids can remember it. So kids, I'm going to invite you to sit on the floor right in front of your chair. Or parents, if you have like a one, two, three-year-old, put them in your lap because you are going to be their boat. And kids, as you sit on the floor, you're in a boat, and you are one of the disciples. Now, adults, you are more than welcome to join in on this, and you can be sitting in a boat right there in your chair, okay? Because we're going to get our boats to rock in here in just a second, okay? So this story is called Jesus Calms the Storm. And the Bible tells us that Jesus had been teaching the crowds parables, stories. And it was evening, and he said to his disciples, hey, guys, let's get into the boat, and let's go to the other side of the lake. So they did. They got into the boat, right? And so they're rowing their boats. So you need to all start rowing your boats. Come on. Let me see you start rowing your boats. Very good. Good, good, good. And you're swaying a little bit because it's just a little bit breezy outside, right? So the boats sway a little bit as they're going across the lake. Well, then the Bible tells us that a furious squall came up. Now, what is a furious squall? 
that's like a big windstorm comes up, okay? And so it starts to blow your boat a little bit. So you got to row a little harder and rock a little bit faster because your boat is swaying around. Oh, there's some good wind sounds. Thank you. Good job, Jonathan. Okay, hear the wind blowing? Oh, and it gets a little bit stronger to the point where the waves start coming up over the side of your boat. So you got to rock even harder and row even harder. And it's getting a little scary, so you got to look scared, right? And there's waves coming up, and the disciples are thinking, oh, my word, we are going to sink. <sighs> but they're like, okay, where is Jesus? Well, guess what the Bible says? Jesus in the back of the boat, he's laying on a cushion sleeping. Are you kidding me? Sleeping during a furious squall? Hmm. Well, he is. So the disciples turn around, and they said, teacher. Everybody say, teacher. Teacher. They said, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if we drown? And you know what? Jesus sat up. And Jesus said, quiet. Be still. And just like that, the wind and the waves, they stopped. And it was still. And the disciples were absolutely amazed that Jesus could calm the wind and the waves. And it was still. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, friends, why were you so scared? And in their head, they're probably thinking, well, there was a little bit of a storm just a minute ago. And we thought we were going to sink, right? And Jesus said, where's your faith? Don't you trust me? Now, when I think about this story, what really sticks out in my mind is the idea of peace. Jesus brought peace during that storm. And, you know, there's a lot of days that we have that are really, really good. The sun is shining. We get to play with our favorite toys. We get to go outside and run. Grades are really good at school. I get to play on the winning team. My family is healthy. The bills are all paid. My job is going great. Things seem all good. Things are at peace. But what about those days when things get a little rough, when your favorite toy breaks, and you're not on the winning team, you're on the losing team? Maybe the job isn't going so great. And you're having a hard time paying those bills. Where's the peace in all of that? Well, this story about Jesus calms the storm is a great reminder that even in times of fear and great struggle and trial, we can still find peace knowing that God is right there with us. God promises to never leave us. You know, our God did not promise that we would have easy days, did he? But he promises that he will never leave us and that he will give us peace. We need to keep our faith and hope in him. If you've been joining us on Facebook Live the past few weeks, or downtown kids, if you've been watching the stories that we've been putting on downtown, it's been about the Holy Spirit and how God sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And we can tie this idea of peace into the giving of the Holy Spirit. You know, if you think back, Jesus met with his disciples, the same guys that were in that boat with him. He met with them for the Last Supper. And they ate together. And Jesus knew that he was soon going to die. He was soon going to be crucified on the cross. And he knew that the disciples' lives were soon going to be turned upside down. And so he walks with them to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's going to soon be betrayed. And he tells his disciples, hey, my Father God, he's going to send you a counselor. It's the Holy Spirit. And he's going to bring you peace. And he'll be with you. And in John 14, chapter 27, Jesus tells his disciples, Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. You guys, the promise of peace isn't just for the disciples during the storm. And it's not just for the disciples when the gift of the Holy Spirit was promised. It's for us too. There are times that our world seems to be turned upside down. But we need to remember that amidst the struggles and the trials, that our God gives us hope and he gives us peace. In the eye of the storm, I'm never alone. In the middle of the roar, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your 
Before we, before we start the groove here, Daryl, I just got a thought. So oftentimes when we gather in worship, we, we can, we can it's, it's easy to be passive, right? It's easy to be very passive uh, when we gather and we've got, you know, some lovely musicians and people, you know, leading and stuff. But uh, the song that we're singing is actually a song that we know in downtown, right? For those kids that are in downtown, this song has motions and you know them and you've learned them. And the, and the goal today is to help your adult comrades internalize the song as you have. Through motions, okay? So I want to invite all of you to stand up. Everybody. Everybody to stand up. Is this too much charismatic calisthenics? Is everybody doing okay? You guys kind of like, oh man, this is a whole lot of, you know, it's a whole lot of movement here. Um, Miss Meredith has generously agreed to come and help us and teach us some of these uh, motions. So can we just, can we do this together? In the eye of the storm. How, how is it? In the eye of the storm. In the eye of the storm. I am never alone. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor, right? When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me. Oh, you got it. In the eye of the storm. Oh, you can clap your hands. That'd be all right. and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith I see the future my picture slowly fade away and when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face I find my peace in Jesus name sing it in the eye of the storm I'm never alone in the middle of the world don't know how I'm gonna make ends me. I did my best, now I'm scared to death that I might lose everything. And when sickness takes my smile away, there's nothing I can do. My only hope is to trust in you. myself I'm not going to cry. I'm <laughs> just not going to, but I don't know. <laughs> um, some of you might want to have a seat. Some of you might want to come and kneel. We're about to go to prayer. And uh, we wipe down the altars. We're very serious about disinfecting and keeping people safe. I hope you know that. So if you'd like to come, if you have a need in your heart or somebody that you love and you want to represent them, you can come on down. Gracious Father in heaven, our hearts today are full, and we are thankful for your body. We are thankful for how you love. We are 
we're thankful that we are not alone. I lift up to you these uh, who are kneeling here. I don't know what it is that they are calling out to you, but I agree with what your Holy Spirit wants to do. Would you do a, a wonderful thing? And most importantly, uh, as they work through whatever it is they are praying for, would you cause them to look more like Jesus? That's the biggest need all of us have, that we would look more like you. We pray that you would use these days the concern about jobs, the concern about the economy, the concern about health. I, I pray that you use all of this to mold us and to cast us increasingly in the image of Christ. We pray your protection over our congregation. I do, Lord. I, I pray that you put a bubble of protection around each of our families and that this would not come near these we love. We pray for the healthcare workers and other people on the front lines battling uh, a virus. We pray you protect them, give them wisdom and discretion. Help us, Father, to not only become more like you, but to let the world know who you are and how you love. We pray these things, Jesus. We pray these things, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the eye of the storm, I'm never alone. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. So, have a seat. I, uh, I, I just, let me have the house lights just a little bit. I just got to see these people, please. <laughs> So I brought my camera, and I, I've been taking pictures, you know, and so in the last service over the axis, I came out to pray, and I put my camera on a music stand, and halfway through the prayer, and it looks like a lens uh, broke, and uh, so I can't take pictures right now, so I just got to see you, so I remember you. Welcome back, and uh, yeah. We have been praying for you. We are praying that these are some of the best days of the body of Christ. God bless. Thanks, Pastor Doug. Good morning. I, uh, regarding that little tech mishap. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many times in my life I've heard the phrase, Brad Taylor, Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Yeah. It's, it's like, it was just very appropriate, you know? So, welcome. We're so glad to, to have you with us today. Uh, what a treat to have Miss Pam join us for a little bit today. And I know you kids out there are so happy to see her. And just a couple notes for you. While we don't have Kids Town open yet, uh, we do have some opportunities for the kids to uh, continue to just stay connected. So this this week, in fact, over the next two days, Miss Pam will have uh, Zoom calls with the first and the fifth graders. So if you've got somebody that age at your house, uh, they do not want to miss it. The, the first time they had one of these with the fifth graders, we've got a fifth grader, and Keaton was running around the house getting, these are the things he collected, a ukulele, a spoon, a banana, and his guinea pig. Now, I, this sounds like the beginning of a bad joke to me, but these are the things that Miss Pam had the kids like running around to get. I don't even know what was going on, but some sort of a scavenger hunt. If you've got, if you've got kids, make sure that they connect with Miss Pam on one of their Zoom calls. There's information on uh, the online bulletin about that. You can find that at our church website. Also, this past week on Thursday, we had our first live event for kids at the Axis. For, that's for kids birth through fifth grade. And that was another just great time, just an engaging time. So if you've got children that are birth through fifth grade, uh, coming up on Thursday, May 28th, we're going to do that again over at the Axis, and we'd love to have you join us for that. 
For uh, a number of our seniors, this year obviously did not end the way that they would have hoped, you know, just kind of an abrupt end to some of their expectations for graduation and uh, open houses and those kind of things. And, and in the midst of these very uncertain times, we want to uh, continue to be able to bless these young people, especially during a time when they uh, are not going to experience the outpouring of love and support that they would in a normal year. So what we've done for you is uh, on your way out this morning at the information desk, there are a couple of lists of seniors, one list of all of those who are graduating and another of those who are still hosting open houses. We'd love for you to take one of those lists with you. And if you've got a relationship with one of those seniors who's graduating, or maybe even if you don't and you just would like to send them a note of encouragement and potentially a gift, we would invite you to do that. Now, here's what we want you to do. Um, go ahead and write a card or uh, you know whatever note you would like to write and put the senior's name on the outside of an envelope and bring it back to church with you next week. If you're out there watching online, we're going to make these uh, lists available to you and you can bring those to the church office. You can drop them off and we will deliver those for you in bulk to uh, the young people. We'll just make sure that they get all of those notes from our church family. So we want to just continue to bless and, and love them as we would if it were a, a normal, uh, you know, if 2020 were a normal year for graduation. So make sure that you uh, grab one of those lists on your way out today. This is the time in our service when we nor normally would receive our tithes and offerings, and uh, we're in a situation where we're not going to pass those plates uh, right now for obvious reasons, and so there are two receptacles in the back of the room. If you would like to drop your gifts off on your way out today, we would welcome you to do that. There's one by each door on your way out, and we want to just encourage you to continue giving online. Your faithfulness has just been so, so helpful during this season, and uh, we're very, very grateful for that. So for those of you who are joining us online today, you can go to limacommunitychurch.com slash give. And any of you here in the room, you certainly can do that as well. We're so, so glad to see you. It's such a treat to uh, worship with the people of God here in the room and out there virtually today. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your presence in this place. We thank you for your faithfulness in uncertain times. God, we love you, and we are uh, in a, a place where we continue worshiping you now. And God, even though we are not collecting tithes and offerings right now as we normally would, we pray that you would bless those of us who give, that you would inspire us and lead us to obedience today. God, that, that we may worship you and praise you with all of our lives. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We spend a lot of time reflecting on the darkness of Good Friday and Jesus' death on the cross. Yet the hope Jesus gives does not end with the cross. The cross is just the beginning. Through his resurrection, Christ initiated the rebirth of all creation. In the days following the resurrection of Jesus, everything changed for his followers. Their hearts were stirred with new hope it was as if the new life of Jesus had also given new life to them. God had fulfilled his promise to his people. Though they had been long in the desert, they now experienced the abundant life of their risen king. We too have the hope of resurrection. Christ has not left us to ourselves, but has given us the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us, to sustain us until Christ's coming from death, from decay, from the desert. We have been called to life. Historians have suggested that the terrible plague that rocked the ancient world in the second century, the Roman Empire, took as many as 25% and it was during this time that Christians uh, really established who they were as they, they, they cared for people in the middle of a, of a plague. In fact, it was a century later when the Roman emperor 
uh, called Julian, uh, often called Julian the Apostate, said, these impious Galileans, by that he meant the Christians, they, they support not only their own poor, but ours as well. How can you fight people like this? A, a sociologist named uh, Rodney Stark claimed that the death rates in the ancient world during times of plagues were half that in cities that had Christian communities versus those cities that had none. Uh, skip forward uh, a thousand years to Zurich, uh, Switzerland, when a man named uh, Hudrick uh, Zwingli came January 1, 1519, and he took the city by storm. He was a marvelous preacher. That summer, uh, he was on vacation, but when he heard that the Black Plague uh, struck Zurich, he came back, um, and uh, it, it was terrible. It took about a third of Zurich, and, and it killed indiscriminately, uh, and he began to minister to the poor, and it put his life at risk. In fact, just a month into that, he took ill. And this preacher who was just so strong now became a weak and feeble man. And days turned into weeks and weeks into months, and he was wasting away. In fact, he wrote a hymn during this time. Four stanzas he wrote before he got sick. Four stanzas he wrote while he was sick. And four he wrote after he recovered. I want to read you the four he wrote while he was sick. He said, my pains increase, haste to console, for fear and woe seize body and soul. Death is at hand, my senses fail, my tongue is dumb, now Christ prevail. Lo, Satan strains to snatch his prey, I feel his grasp, must I give way? He harms me not, I fear no loss, for here I lie. Beneath the cross. All through Christian history, Christians have distinguished themselves during times like these. Skip forward uh, another century. Now in Germany, a, a, a young man named Martin Rinkhart wanted to be a pastor all of his might, but he, he kept applying and he kept getting turned down. Finally, a, a spot opened in his hometown and he was appointed a pastor there in, uh, in 1617. But in 1618, uh, Germany entered into a 30-year war. And it was uh, cataclysmic. Uh, in fact, the, the city where he was was a walled city. And so people from the countryside came for safety's sake to live in the city. And historians recount how they fought over dead cats in the street to eat them. Um, and then about 20 years later, still 10 years to go in this great war, uh, uh, the plague, the bubonic plague struck. And, and it struck off and on from 1300 to over uh, close to 1700. And, and uh, it, it, it wreaked havoc. Something like a third to 40% of the population died. He was one of four pastors, and they began to do... Uh, 10 funerals a day. Finally, one of the pastors, quite overwhelmed, he just ran away. He, he just ran. Two of the other pastors died, leaving only Martin Rinkhart to do all these funerals. 8,000 funerals in his first year, including one for his wife. And uh, all through this, the Lord protected his health. Later in life, he wrote this hymn which apparently is still sung in Lutheran circles. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices who wondrous things has done in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. And just, just one more, if I may. National Public Radio, uh, their, their marquee, a program, All Things Considered, hosted by uh, Robert Siegel. And Robert was interviewing a man named Stephen Rowden uh, not long ago. Rowden um, volunteered to uh, do a stint in Monrovia, Liberia with Doctors Without Borders. 
And when he got there, he found that he was assigned to lead a team that would go into homes and remove Ebola uh, victims. Now, if you know anything about that disease, you know that the fastest way to get it is to come into contact with somebody who does. And if you get Ebola, uh, you've got between a 50 to 90% chance of dying yourself. And so they would cover up, and it wasn't uncommon, even with all of that, to succumb. Uh, as he shared all this, Robert Siegel finally said, uh, are you a religious man? He said, oh, yes, I am. I, I, I'm a Christian. He said, well, this must have shaken your faith. He said, oh, no, no. He said, I found great strength from my faith and great strength from my family. You know, friends, for 2,000 years, you have rushed in where other people have rushed out. You have made a difference, and I believe are making a difference. And, and I think one of the reasons uh, Christians have made uh, these strong commitments uh, are, are, are there really two major reasons. One is we understand that we've, we, we have a home, and we're just temporarily here. Secondly, we understand that he dwells within us. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. And it gives us a boldness and a courage that we would not otherwise have. Uh, John 14, um, beginning in verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands. He says, And, and I will ask the Father... And he, the Father, will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. Um, and the, the advocate is the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it, it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, he said, he, being the Father, will give you another advocate. And I don't have my pen, <laughs> so I can't do this. <laughs> another advocate. So he, he has two different words he could use here for another. One is, is allos, A-L-L-O-S, which means another of the same kind. The second word he uses, or he could have used, was heteros, which means another of a different kind. Now, we just have one word, another. Greek language is so much more, uh, you know, has so many layers that ours does not have. So what Jesus is saying here, he says, I will, he, he will send you another of the same kind. If I had a pen, and say it was red, and I gave you another red pen, just like the red pen I have, I would give you an alos pen. However, if I had a blue pen, very similar, but not the same, and I gave that to you, that would be a heteros pen. Jesus is saying, the Father will give you the same kind of advocate you already have, which happens to be Jesus. Remember, it says in John, uh, 1 John 2, 1, I, I write this, no, John's writing, I write this that you would not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ. Jesus, and that's the same word here. He uses advocate. Jesus is our advocate, and he is saying... The Father is going to send another to live in you. Another of the same kind. Now, how many people have thought how wonderful it would be? How wonderful it would be if Jesus were here, right? I mean, just think about it. If Jesus was here and your, your, your dog got hit by a car, Jesus could go and raise the dog back to life. And if a cat got hit by a car, Jesus could do the funeral, right? 
But, but what Jesus is saying is this, this beats my being here. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you who is another of the same kind of an advocate that I am. Advocate, that, that word um, doesn't translate well. The, the, the word in Greek is, is parakletos. Parakletos. And uh, we have to use several English words to, to get what that word means. Um, uh, words like comforter. He says, he will be our comforter. How wonderful is this? That he gives us strength in times of pain or distress. That he consoles and encourages. When we go through hard times, he is a comforter. Words like counselor. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, is a counselor. He, he gives advice and instruction. He, he, he helps us walk through difficult times and hard decisions. Advocate. Helper is another word. Helps us to become increasingly like Jesus. Helps us in difficult situations. Intercessor is another word from there. He is our intercessor. It says in Romans 8, 27, you know that when we don't know how to pray, he prays for us. With groans and utterances too deep for words, the Holy Spirit, who dwells in you, prays for you. Here in John, the word parakletos is translated advocate, which is a legal term. It means to walk alongside of. It means to mediate uh, to walk alongside of, what a beautiful word picture. Instead of him being way out in front and saying, come on, come on, come on, come on. Or instead of him being, being behind saying, push, 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 he's, he's besides us, helping us. Uh, just one last word, strengthener. He strengthens us, makes us stronger in our minds and in our spirits. Our, our spirits need strengthening. Our emotions need strengthening. The longer we walk with him, the more his Holy Spirit from inside does these things. Jesus says, before long, the, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. I will, the Father will send another of the same kind of advocate to dwell within you. And because of that, down through these 2,000 plus years, Followers of Jesus Christ have not shrunk back in times of peril or concern. They've been strong. They've been courageous. So he summarizes, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And will remind you of everything I have said to you. And then Jesus says this, peace I leave with you my peace I give you. I, I, do not, uh, I do not give to you as the world gives. John Wesley writes uh, that this is not the, the general peace. This is not, this is not the, the peace of God or, or the peace of your own conscience. What he is saying, uh, John Wesley says, is Jesus is giving his peace in particular, the peace that Jesus enjoys, the peace that Jesus creates, he said, I give it to you in this instant, not as the world gives, which is unsatisfying and unsettled and transient, but my peace filling your soul constantly with tranquil peace. You know, in these days, uh, we might think about 
um, when we feel peace and when we don't. And, and if you're like me, there there have been times in these last nine or ten weeks where I haven't had peace. And as I look at that, I, I have to recognize that I had let my mind uh, become undisciplined and began to pay attention to all the voices around me. Look at the internet and hear all this woe and read the paper and all this woe and, 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 and kind of get overwhelmed. But then when I come away and I spend time with him, <laughs> he gives peace. Adam Clark said, this is Jesus' last will and testament. He said he gave his soul to his father, his body to Joseph of Arimathea, his clothes to the, to the soldiers, his mother to John. He said, but what do I give my disciples? I know, he says. I'll give them my peace. There are times when I pray for people. And I say, Jesus, your words, your words, Jesus, my peace I give you. My peace I leave you. I do not give as the world gives. I ask for that peace for them. And then he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. The word there for troubled is an interesting word. It means to agitate. To take away the calmness of mind. To disquiet. To make restless. To strike one's spirit with fear and dread. To make anxious or distressed. To perplex the mind. That's trouble. Right? <laughs> he said, don't let that happen to you. You have control of that. Don't let that happen to you. And don't be afraid. The word he uses for afraid is found once in the entire Bible. It's here. And it means to make timid or fearful. That's the verb form. The noun form is also found just once, and that's in 2 Timothy one seven, but this, the Lord did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of love, and peace, and of a sound mind. He said, "Don't, <laughs> don't go to pot. Don't, don't get carried away with the winds of of the internet and the and the newscast. Don't do that. Don't, don't become fearful." My spirit dwells in you. Amen. That's a good word. My Father in heaven, as we are working our way through this pandemic, we thank you now that we are able to gather. I know it's different than we've ever gathered before, and we're going to have to walk through this and figure this all out, but we thank you that we can see each other's faces. And I thank you for the many who are right now watching us on Facebook Live and on our webpage, and I, I pray your blessing upon them as they wait and as you do your work in them. Bless them, I pray. Help us all to become increasingly like Jesus, to become aware of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. To not be fearful, to not be timid, but to be bold and to be your people. I pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.